Welcome back, folks. So we're going to go right into the uh, sort of the second to last session of the day. Uh, moving forward with the CAT Coalition. And I'm looking for, here we go. So as folks settle down, uh, I'll introduce the moderator for today, uh, for the uh, moving forward with the CAT Coalition, Mr. Martin Knopp, the Associate Administrator for the Office of Operations, Federal Highway Administration. Thank you, Egan, and good afternoon. We're going to bring up the panel for this kind of, and we're, we're in the kind of slowing down for today, kind of takeaways that we want to talk about. So if I could ask our uh, panelists to come up here and join me. I will uh, give them some time and say, how many of you have heard the analogy in physics to Schrodinger's cat? We don't have more Big Bang Theory uh, viewers or people that like physics. That analogy talked about in physics and quantum mechanics about uh, the cat being both dead and alive simultaneously until it's measured. That's not this cat. Connected and automated transportation technology. There's been eras of cooperative automation. So right now, I'm going to stick with the connected and automated transportation, the CAT Coalition. And here, uh, representing key sponsors on, in a cooperative agreement with us, with uh, Federal Highways and USDOT. And each of them are, are uh, bringing their members, very involved in this space, and, and also through the coalition where they help us work together to have uh, synchrony and focus on some things collectively together. So I thought, how can I bring in herding cats? But, uh, you know, Schrodinger's cat will have to do for today. And let me, uh, I'm not going to go into bios, but I think you know all of these leaders already. I'll start with, just go down the line here. Jim Tymon, the executive director for Ashto. Laura Chase, president and CEO, ITS America. S Steve Kusiemba, deputy executive director and chief technical officer of ITE. I think that's a couple days. current until <laughs> Tuesday, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Steve, do you want to tell them your title well, as Tuesday, of Tuesday? It's already up on the board, so yeah, on Tuesday I changed titles. <laughs> okay, okay. So, thank you. And Hillary Kane, Vice President of Alliance for Automotive Innovation, and you heard Hillary already responding to some questions that may sound similar. It's not that we didn't uh, pay attention to that. We thought with this you know, we're in the kind of takeaway perspectives here from these leaders to help kind of reiterate with infra uh, infrastructure owner operators and technology, cellular providers, local agencies, ITS suppliers, private industry innovators. This group has quite an array of members that are represented here. And so I wanted to get some of their takeaways and, and closing thoughts here uh, for today. And let me start with asking each one of you, similarly, what do you want to see in the plan by the time it's completed in early 2024? Jim, if we could. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, and, and, uh, and thanks for, for having all of us uh, up here. Uh, I, I think... Um, I appreciate you talking a little bit about the CAT Coalition and the fact that, uh, you know, this is an endeavor that we've been involved with for a number of years in a partnership with, with FHWA. And I think uh, we've got a, a lot of great work that we've done and a lot of great work, I think, that we still have to come. And, and I think uh, what we've discussed today uh, and this summit here is uh, a great opportunity for us to look forward. And uh, to be honest, uh, I think our first impressions with uh, the draft plan, deployment plan that was put forward are extremely positive, as I think you've heard from uh, most of the panelists that, that have, have gone on today. Uh, we think the plan is extremely well-structured. It lays out a clear vision and a mission. 
uh, with concrete goals and targets over both the, the short term and the medium term and the long term. Uh, and I think that's exactly what we need to be able to push forward, to be able to move the ball forward here. Uh, also extremely happy to see NHTSA re-engaged and, and part of this process. Uh, you know, about a year and a half ago, we had that first summit, and uh, you know, one of the one of the comments that I had made during that was that we really do need to see NHTSA more engaged, and we need to uh, be able to get uh, some more direction and and uh, and a forward-looking vision from them as part of this. And uh, so, we were really happy to see uh, that as part of of today as well. Um, you know, so I, I think we're just very excited to see the plan, to see the, the, uh, the goals that are outlined here. Um, I think that it is great to see. Uh, the, I, I know that some folks have said there's not a lot of specificity in here with the metrics and the targets, and I, I, I actually am extremely happy to see um, the targets that are in here and the metrics that can be, um, that can be identified. And I think that, uh, you know, going through the process and providing comments and collecting uh, some feedback here on the draft deployment plan, I think that uh, we can look at whether or not they need to be refined, but it's great that there's actual metrics in each of these for us to be able to move forward because it gives us all uh, goals for us to be able to push for. So, uh, you know, we're looking forward to working with FHWA and USDOT as a whole and the other partners that we have here at the table uh, over the next several months to, to finalize this and then to push it forward. Thank you, Jim. Just go down the row. Steve. Thank you, Martin, and thank you all for the uh, nice, warm congratulations on my new position. I, again, I think, like, like others, we were extremely pleased to see a plan. You know, when we met a, year, a little over a year ago, we said, we need a plan. Well, we got a plan, which is, which is really exciting to see. You heard several of the panelists earlier today, and, and especially uh, our USDOT brethren, talking about safety as the real raison d'etre, the reason, the reason for being for a lot of this, and I think safety is important. When you look at the safe system approach, which is really how we are now embodying the National Roadway Safety Strategy, one key tenant of that is that safety is a shared responsibility. It's a key tenant of this uh, safe system approach. Well, this plan represents V2X is a shared responsibility. It's not just the IOOs, it's not just the OEMs, it's a lot of different players, and I think the plan does a good job of representing that, and I think that some of the feedback you're going to get from today might even fill in a few pieces of that, uh, which is very positive. Uh, ITE represents a lot of local municipal uh, traffic engineers and planners, and I want to make sure that this plan adequately represents the local agencies. Uh, I think the one thing that I've known, known over the years of the partnership between AASHTO and ITE is we really try to represent state and local to the best of our ability. And I think the plan does that to some degree, but I think it, there's a couple places where we might be able to enhance the local element of that, so I want to do that. And, and one place in particular uh, where you talk about top 75 metropolitan areas, well maybe that needs to be a more data-driven approach and where the, the 75 areas with the most need they may not be the top 75 in population, but they might have the most need in terms of traffic fatalities or pedestrian fatalities. Um, so I think that's really important. And I also want to um, note that it was great to see NHTSA this morning as well. That was long overdue, but really welcome to see. So kudos to you guys for setting this up. Uh, and uh, like Ashto, we look forward to participating. Thank you, Steve. Um, Laura, ITS America. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I will start by echoing my thanks, not to sound like a broken record, but of course I do want to, you know, officially uh, thank USDOT um, and all the partners who worked really hard to get this plan out the door. As everyone knows, um, I have been beating a drum for a plan for a long time, <laughs> along with my colleagues here. And um, I am really pleased. I know it is not easy. We always say this um, about to our public sector members. Um, that it's not easy to take a risk, it's not easy to put something out there, and I commend USD for DOT for doing exactly that. You put something out there, people are happy you put it out there, they may not agree with every single point in it, but that's okay, we need a robust dialogue, we need robust feedback, so we're really pleased to see that, so thank you for doing that. Thank you for bringing NHTSA to the table. I think all of us up here uh, have the same sentiment about that. We're really pleased to, to see that and to hear um, the comments from Administrator Carlson. And I will just say in terms of uh, what do we want to see in the plan, I think 
Uh, we want to see the how. How do we get there? So there's targets in the plan, right? But how do we actually achieve that? And I think that's really going to be critically important over the next, uh, you know, several weeks and couple of months is uh, really putting that meat on the bones. There was a lot of reference to chicken this morning. So we need that meat on the bone. We need a big, juicy chicken. Um, so <laughs> that's what we're looking forward to seeing uh, in the plant. Um, so as I was at 11 a.m., we are still relieved um, and, and appreciative. Um, and I, I will add to that I have a new, a new one. We're also, I think, feeling, I am at least in my OAM and, and other members that are here today, I think are feeling a little hopeful, which is, I think is really good, um, which is, is a good way to, to maybe end today. Um, uh, you know, dare I say, I feel like there, there may be a sense that maybe we're turning an important corner here, and that's helpful. Um, I will echo the comments about NHTSA. One thing I would recommend as the plan gets finalized and built out um, is that we start to see a thread throughout the plan on what specific actions NHTSA will be taking alongside uh, their partners at, at Federal Highways and elsewhere in the department, but that would be helpful to see reflected in the plan. Excellent. And, and thank you all. You, Laura, you asked how. Mm -hmm. Well, I believe right now no one is as enthusiastic towards this as our administrator, Bat. And that's hard for <laughs> me to say, in, you know, reflecting me and each of you, but that's one way that gives me uh, comfort that he's not gonna be satisfied if we don't figure out the how. And, and part of us, this group and everyone here virtually and together, we're gonna figure that out. Let's, let's move to Another question, it's, and Hillary, do you want to start with you? This may be a surprise to you since you were on an earlier panel, okay. but uh, <laughs> what resources do you feel are needed to help scale and deploy V2X technology? Yeah, so, and, and I'm not going to repeat my answer from earlier because I actually do want to hear from Laura and Steve and Jim because they haven't had a chance to share their viewpoints, but I s shared earlier and it's still the case. I think actually the resources are about internal OEM resources and figuring out where to find the money to devote to these um, deployment of this technology at a time when they're very stressed with electrification and other requirements. Um, so that's still the same answer, but I want to hear from everybody else. Sure. Laura? Uh, sure. So I think I'm going to focus on two things. So the first is education on BDX, and we really heard this, I think, clearly in the deployer panel earlier today, that there's a really wide range of knowledge out uh, uh, in the in the ecosystem uh, on VitaX, and there's a real need for um, significant education um, targeted to different to stakeholders of, let's say, differing um, maturity in the VitaX world. And I think we need to recognize that and we need to address that. So we really need a lot of education that is not just targeted to very, very technical expertise, but is also targeted to folks who are just coming into this space or just maybe kind of shove VDEX to the side because they really thought, well, this isn't going to happen or it's just not a priority right now. And they kind of need to be re-educated because a lot has changed, right? The technology has evolved. Things have evolved. So education. And then I think the second thing is on funding. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, our partners at USDOT being very, you know, I would say um, aggressively clear on how VDEX can be uh, uh, utilized in uh, or eligible in these discretionary programs and um, also, you know, in the NOFOs for them, highlighting in the NOFOs, um, you know, obviously showing that when awards are, are given in VitaX, highlighting those so others see that that's a successful uh, grant application um, and that they start to think about that. And then also, you know, on the formula side, um, you know, empowering agencies to know how to um, ask for the funding, uh, or excuse me, for the prioritization of VDEX and their formula funding. And we heard some um, discussion today of that among the panel, and I think um, just DOT really highlighting those opportunities and that it's, it's a priority for you to uh, be able to help develop this national uh, interoperable connectivity plan is going to be important. Thank you. How about ITE's perspective? I think perspective? when it comes to the funding, uh, I think all the grant programs are great, and USDOT does have a lot of different grant programs, and it's the ever-expanding grant programs. The challenge is, especially for the smaller agencies, they could spend full time writing grant requests, and they don't have the resources to do that because the same guy that writes the grants is the same guy who's dealing with parking collection and garbage collection, and they just don't have time or resources for all of that. 
if there was a way to have some uh, a more of a dedicated funding stream, and I know those of us that were in the early days of IVHS and ITS 30 years ago, we had the same type of conversation about dedicated funding. And uh, it took a lot of time before it, the language got into the, into the um, Title I formula programs, but it did. Uh, we need to continue to do that for this, but, and Blaine actually pointed out, not sure if it's a carrot or a stick, but how do we really encourage, even if that funding is available through a formula program, it's still the same old battle. Well, do I fill a pothole or do I put comms to a cabinet? And that's a tough battle for a small agency who's probably dealing with uh, a local commission or an elected board who's reviewing every line item of their budget, unlike a state where they have a lot of discretion. And when you get down to the local level, they don't have as much discretion. So I'm not sure if there's a way, I don't have the solution for that, but I recognize it's a problem. And I think when it comes to those local agencies that have those commissions or boards or elected groups, if there's a way we can help them see the complete path, that here is a pot of funding for capital deployment, but then there are also some funding available to help with O&M down the road. So it's a sustainable deployment and not just put it in and forget it and you know, six years from now go back and say, oh, well, none of it's operating anymore because I don't have money to fix it. Um, but we gotta be able to see that whole path and help agencies educate their elected officials on it. You know, the education thing that Laura was talking about, be able to help the local um, officials with that. And then my last point, you know, I mentioned about getting comms to a cabinet. That is still a real central, central point that um, we believe, and we don't know for sure, but we believe it's less than 50% of all signalized intersections have comms to the cabinet. That's woefully inadequate if we're gonna be able to do this. You know, 325,000 signals, you know, and you've got less than half that have comms to the cabinet. That's a bare minimum, and that's not an easy thing to solve for many agencies. Do I put comms to the cabinet? Do I upgrade my controllers? Do I do V to X? Well, it's all of the above. They can't do all of the above, so. Thank you, uh, good points. One thing that I will echo, John Hibbard said in an earlier panel about the uh, technology being eligible for 100% federal participation in, in certain um, programs. And also one that's just, we're all collectively learning how to deal with safe streets for all, which is specifically targeting local agencies, and, and it's been pointed out in the eligibility there, so excellent points. How about Ashdo's perspective, Jim? Well, I, I, look, it's great to go last because I can just say that I agree with everything that, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that Hillary, Laura, and Steve have said. <laughs> You're going um, first next time. I, I know, I know. I, I see the pattern here, so. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess I look at it from three perspectives on the resource side. Uh, on the, for, from a funding standpoint, uh, you know, we absolutely need to uh, find a way to make progress with this piece of federal legislation. I mean, it's a historical amount of money that's being put towards infrastructure funding, and we have a unique opportunity here to be able to show uh, that we can invest it in a way that's looking forward into the future and that's utilizing technology. Uh, so from a VDX standpoint, I think we do have a great opportunity here, and, and uh, we're really happy to hear this morning with the announcement of a $40 million NOFO, um, for connected vehicle technologies, that this is you know a, a commitment from 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 FHWA to move forward on that. Uh, interesting, the wording there on, on safety, mobility, and efficiency, and, and I noted, noticed that because that mirrors some of the language in Ashto's strategic plan that looks for safety, mobility, and access for all. And, and I think those are those are words that we can all rally around. Uh, safety is you know I've heard that from several of the panelists today. The number one priority. Uh, Ashto just had a safety summit in Kansas City last week where we talked about how can we make progress in reducing the number of fatalities on our nation's highways. And I think one of the consistent themes is the only way we can get to zero is better use of technology. And, and I know we've heard that from other, uh, from other panelists uh, today. Uh, so we need to be able to access all the different pots of money that are out there, whether it's formula monies that go out to, to state DOTs, whether it's state or local generated revenues uh, that are invested in transportation, or these discretionary grants that are out there. Um, you know, we need to find a way to make sure that projects out there that prioritize the use of technology and connected uh, vehicle infrastructure uh, is, are, are gonna be rated 
high enough to be able to access some of these discretionary grants. Um, two other things I want to talk about from a funding standpoint. Laura mentioned education, and then I wrote down as she was saying this, and Steve mentioned it. Uh, it's not just policymakers, but also CEOs and elected yeah. officials, right? I mean, we can, at the policymaking level, we can we can make sure that we've got some great advocates like we have in the room here, but if it gets up to elected officials and they say, well, this isn't a priority, we're not gonna be able to, to really move the needle the way that we wanna move it. So, uh, so glad that Steve mentioned elected officials because okay. I think that's extremely important. And the other thing is technical training. We have to make sure that we're building a workforce that's able to operate and maintain the technologies that we're talking about putting out here in the next 10 years as the plan talks about. So we definitely need to be investing on the training side to make sure our workforce is able uh, to make this step with us as we start to move the needle. Excellent. You know, all of you have been talking about education and I'll share something I picked up from our local division office, Deputy Division Administrator Rachel Topeka had mentioned to us yesterday that she was explaining to family member about this Vita X um, summit. And the, the individual asked, Vita X, yeah, vehicle to everything. And thought it was a campaign of trying to have people drive their cars everywhere. <laughs> Which, so that's an important, you know, that, that's an eye opener that we need to make sure what we're talking about translates to all these groups you're talking about, as well as yeah. our own family members who may think that's what we're talking about. So, <laughs> okay, this is gonna come back to you, Jim. You know, there's a randomness to this. What is one action that you'd like to see coming out of this summit and completed in the next three months? You know, I, I'd like to see, um, better socialization of, of this vision and, and mission that, that's in this plan uh, throughout the stakeholder community um, and, um, and a better public understanding of, of the benefits that we'll get if we're able to implement this vision. Uh, because I think that, you know, when we all get into a room together, I think we have to remember that, as Martin just laid out with this, that great example, uh, we've got to be able to explain this in, in, in a 30 second pitch in an elevator for why this is important. So when we talk amongst ourselves, we can get into the weeds and we can assume that each other, that we all know what we're talking about. But if we're going to be able to educate this to a broader community outside of people in this room, we need to be able to tell the story uh, in a very efficient manner uh, that talks about the benefits that are going to be seen beyond uh, not just the transportation uh, aspects of it, but how is this gonna impact people's quality of life? And I think obviously the safety aspect of it is the number one uh, way we're able to do that. But I think we need to be able to better socialize this outside of the people that are in this room. And, and I think that's, that's one of the things I'd love to see. I'd also love to see um, you know, some, some uh, better cooperation from the FCC. Uh, now, in the next three months, I'm not sure how much progress we can make in that, but we need to keep moving the needle there as well. You're going to receive a lot of comments on this plan. You already did a lot today, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot online. And um, my hope over the next three months is that you stay bold and stay aggressive. Don't water it down. Don't, don't be influenced by a lot of the comments that you're going to get. I think what you heard loud and clear here is there's a lot of excitement about the boldness of this plan. So I encourage you all to, to, to stay bold with your goals. And of course, yes, I want to see the FCC commitments. And, and I'd love to see OEM commitments. I think that would re reassure the IOOs an awful lot to see some of that. Thank you. Laura? So in the spirit of being bold, um, this morning NHTSA said, you know, this doesn't take us out of the game. It puts us back in the game. So the door was open this much. So in the next few months, I want to kick it down. <laughs> and I want NHTSA to convene the OEMs to say, what can we do? What is needed to help actually get deployment going? That's what I'd like to see. Um, and then I'll just add on, because I feel like we have to say it, is we want final rules from the FCC. Thank you. Thank you. Hillary. Yeah, so um, 
uh, final rules from the FCC, or at least forward <laughs> movement, because right now they're not doing anything yeah. on it, I don't right. think. I think they've fo been focused on the waivers, which has been helpful, but there's there's work to be done on the final rules. And I, and, and I you know, it was, um, when we convened in August of 2022, um, you know, I, I mentioned that those final rules are really going to be very, very essential to OEMs making commitments. So it's, it's it, we're back to chicken and egg here, but um, those rules are, I think, are going to be um, the, la the, the last major hurdle standing in the way. Thank you. If we could keep the pattern going and, <laughs> and uh, have you talk about what would you like to see in the short term, next two to three years, from other stakeholders, including from uh, Federal Highways, OSTR, Joint Program Office, DOT, or from other sectors? Yeah, so um, uh, again, nothing's changed since earlier today, but what I think would be most helpful is also to see, continue to see infrastructure build out. As I said, that when we do have um, uh, the first couple of OEMs decide that they are going to jump in this pool, it sure will be helpful to sell the technology to their customers to tell them it does something, um, and communicating with infrastructure could be the something that it will do as they drive off the lot. Excellent. Uh, I will say impatience uh, from this morning. I think I want our whole community, including our USDOT colleagues, to be impatient. We need to deliver on the short-term goals and the plan. So we need to actually keep working together in this, this very collective spirit and be impatient about what we want to achieve get it done so that when you do get to that point, we have something to show. I want to build on what Laura said earlier about the how. I think we, in the next two to three years, we need to have the how nailed down much better. And that includes on the funding side, not just on the public side, but on both sides. The business models for the private side, the, the government funding for the, the public side, getting away from competitive grants. Um, and having some, you know, having some strategies for how that's going to work on all different sides. Um, I also, I think it was Elise who mentioned earlier that, you know, we need to have this ability to adjust as we learn, as we get into the plan. The first couple years of the plan, we're going to maybe stumble a little bit and, and might have to adjust, but that's okay. You know, if we can be nimble and adjust a little bit, that's, that means we're going in the right direction. Good points. Thank you. How about Jim? So I, I, I've... I want to see continued strong leadership from, from USDOT uh, across all of the modes. Uh, you know, I think that today was a great first step in, in establishing that strong leadership, and we want to see that continued over the next two to three years. Uh, I think that will help us uh, continue to move in the right direction, and, uh, and I think that will help bring states and localities along uh, if there's that strong leadership. And I think that will also bring along um, the auto manufacturers, right? I think that the, the fact that, uh, as Hillary mentioned, right, if you get the consistency from the FCC and from NHTSA, that should help the private sector uh, come along as well. And, and I think that these next two to three years are critical. We need to be able to prove concepts. We need to be able to go out and show that we can deploy technology in a way uh, that is appropriate and effective and then that will bring others along on the continuum as well. So uh, it, it's a critical phase, that two to three year time period. Uh, and I think with strong leadership from USDOT, it, we can really start to make some progress. Can I add something? Is that okay? Go off script. Um, well, there's there's been two comments that have been said today. I just want to I want to jump on them because I don't disagree with them, but I just think we have to be. So someone earlier today said we have to be willing to fail, and you said we have to be willing to stumble along the way, and I don't disagree with that. But from an OEM perspective, right. You cannot fail or stumble when it comes to vehicle safety technology. Right, right. And I think we also have to acknowledge that the, the standards to which automakers are held when they're deploying new safety technology is failure and stumbling are not things that generally work well in that space. And, so and, I just, I, yeah. I just want to make sure that that's you know, and What I meant there. by stumbling, I meant in the, in the, know, plan, know, in the development of the plan. Yeah, but exactly. I think Cruise is a great example right now of, you know, they're being punished for some of their trial and error right now. And, and that's a challenge that, you know, the OEMs operate in a different world. They yeah. can't fail. You're right. You're right. But I think that on the, on the policy side, right, we, we can 
push the envelope a little bit and not be afraid to fail in that area, right? So I know Blaine, is, yeah. so I know Blaine is here, and Carlos Paceros, who's the executive director of the Utah Department of Transportation, says that he has a superpower. He can fail quicker than anybody. He, says he <laughs> learns from those failures, and that helps them succeed in the future. So just because some of these goals are ambitious in, in, in this draft plan doesn't mean that we should be afraid to take them on because we're afraid of failure. We should still look to take them on, uh, and if and if we fail, fail quickly, readjust, and then come up with new goals and new metrics. So, I, I Hillary, I agree with you 100%. It's a different model, I think, on the OEM side, but I, I do think that other aspects of this plan, we shouldn't be afraid of failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Exactly why we asked Hillary to repeat, but join <laughs> this for the perspectives here. Yeah. For each of you, and we don't have to go in any particular order, what comes to mind that most surprised you today? Besides that question. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. I, um, <clears throat> I would love to see the end user, whether it's AAA, whether it's transit operators, whether it's first responders. I'd love to see some end user engagement somewhere in this process. You know. We put a lot of great technology in vehicles and, and other things, and um, I always use my, my mother as an example of ADAS because she bought a new vehicle and it's got lane keeping support in it. She hates it, she always tries to turn it off. I'm like, why? She goes, well, because I can't drive her on the potholes here in Michigan. <laughs> so I understand, it's a challenge, but you know what? The end user's gotta be part of this conversation somewhere. Thank you. Anyone else surprises today? I don't know if I would say surprises, but I think, um, you know, the multimodal aspect as well. I think that, you know, talking about, um, talking more about what we can do to bring in transit. Obviously, uh, from a safety standpoint, there's a huge opportunity from a vulnerable road user side to be able to make progress here. Um, but I think that we can, uh, we can continue to, to broaden the, the group here by, by talking about how other modes um, can can be involved in this discussion and in this effort as well. Yeah, I don't know if I have a surprise necessarily, but I definitely agree with the comments um, that both Jim and Steve have made. Um, I, I actually think it's critically important that we really talk about the end user. You know, uh, as you all know, I don't speak in technical terms. And as a mother with two, you know, new teen drivers this year, uh, you know, when I speak about VDX to people, I talk about it gives you critical information, safety information so you can make a better decision. Connects you to other road users. Like very, very simple. I don't get into the technicalities. I don't get into the, you know, any of that stuff. And then people say, oh. And to me, I think, um, I do think it's it's really important that we're able to tell the story in a way that that resonates with people. So I think um, I guess that would be the the one comment I would add. You know, an, an additional plus one too. I don't have. I don't. Have, although, how about this? I am pleasantly surprised that there are this many people still in the room for this talk. So how about that? So I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> I think we envisioned we would be talking to about five people yeah. at this point, so amen. So how about final question, just any, any final thought that you, you would like to share with the audience here and, and online as we, we head towards the uh, closing after this, so. How about, uh, I, I, those of you who've ever talked to me in a, in a Zoom call, when I'm in my office, I have a sign behind me and it just says, get it done. So maybe I'll just leave, let's get it done. Get it done. Get it done. I like it. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Get it done. Let, let's not give up. We've had setbacks before. We seem to be moving in the right direction here. Let's use that momentum to continue to move the ball forward. Excellent. Will you help me thank our panelists here?